I built an Emacs mode called Live Coding in Python that lets you run your Python code as you type it. For example, this code prints a greeting to my friend Alice. When I change the name to Bob, the display on the right updates immediately. I don't even have to save the file. In this tutorial, I'm going to demonstrate two things. The live coding display that I just showed and live unit tests. If you want to try out these tools, you can go to the website and find installation instructions. You can also find other versions of this. If you don't use Emacs, you can find the PyCharm version that includes some turtle graphics support. You can find the Sublime Text version. Or if you don't want to install anything, you can try a little demo that runs in your browser. So let's start with a trivial example. Looking at this, you can easily see th that S starts out as hello and then becomes hello world. But most code you work on is more complicated. Still, you either predict the result by running through the code in your head, or you run it to see the results. One of this project's main goals for live coding is to let programmers' brains focus on writing code instead of running code. If you can see the code's results laid out in front of you, you don't have to hold it all in your head. So, to see the, what happens, I can turn on live coding mode, like so, and it shows me that, as expected, S ends up with hello world. Let's do something more interesting and write a library function that does binary search for a value in a sorted array. The live coding will show us what's happening in our code so we don't have to hold it all in our heads. So let's start again, and we'll define a search function. So n is the number that we're going to look for, and a is an, ar uh, an array or list of sorted numbers. Now we start with a pretty dumb function that never finds anything. When it doesn't find the, it's supposed to return the index where the number was in the list, and if it doesn't find it, it returns a negative number. So it's a bad search function that never finds anything, but let's see how it works when we call it. So we call it, we're looking for the number 2 in the list 1, 2, and 4. And as expected, we can see that i ends up as negative 1. We return negative 1 from the function, and it gets put in i. You can also see that the input parameters are displayed. The number we're looking for, n, is 2, and the list of numbers to look in, a, is 1, 2, and 4. So let's try looking in that list of numbers. The first place we'll look is in the middle. So the low end of the list is always index 0. And the high end, we can calculate by taking the length of a minus 1. And then the middle is just the average of those two. So we say mid equals low plus high divided by 2. So on the left hand side, you can see our code with formulas for what the values will be. And then on the right hand side, you can see the result of calculating those formulas. And you can see, oh, we've made a mistake with mid. Because in Python, a basic division gives me back a float. What I want is an integer, because an index into the list is always an integer. All right, so we've calculated what the index of the middle number is. Now let's get the actual number. We'll say v equals a mid. And you can see that the middle number is 2, so we end up with 2 in v. All right, so now let's check if that's the number we're looking for. If n equals v, then we return the index where we found it, mid. Well, that was lucky. It was in the first place we looked. So we return 1, and i equals 1. Of course, a search function won't usually find what it's looking for in the first place that it looks. So let's try something a little more challenging and look for a number earlier in the list. 
All right, so what we're going to do is we'll put a loop in there and gradually look for smaller and smaller sections of the list. So we'll put a while loop and we'll start with while true. We'll figure out what the condition is in a minute. All right, we move everything over to be inside the loop. Oh, that one we won't do. All right, and so on the right hand side, you can now see that every time it runs through the loop, it adds a column to the display. So let's say if the number did not match the middle uh, item in the part we're looking in, then, well, if the number we're looking for n is less than the value we found in the middle of that section, then we need to look at the smaller set half of the list. So we're going to say that the high index is equal to the mid minus 1. All right, and now you can see that the loop executes twice. The first one is the one we did last time where it just looks in the middle of the whole list. Then we move the high down to index zero. So now low and high are both zero. That's all that's left to look at in the list. And then we calculate mid halfway between zero and zero, it's zero. And we get the value there is one that matches the number we were looking for and we return index zero. Huzzah! Now let's look for something later in the list. So we're going to search for the number one, number four. And so now we've come through the list here. We check to see if it matches the middle number. No. If it's less than the middle number. No. Well, if it's neither of those, it must be greater than. So we say else. If it's Greater than, we want to look at the larger half of the list, the, the right side, and so we will move the low number, and we will say it is equal to mid plus one. Ah, so something's gone wrong. We've got an index error here. Now, here's where we see the difference between live coding and a regular debugger. In a regular debugger, or just running the, the code normally, you would see where something happened, something went wrong, and maybe you'd get a stack trace, but you don't usually see how you got into this situation. Here we can read the, we can walk backwards in time just by reading backwards through these displays. So the index error happened here. You can see that the index we're using is mid, and then we look back a step and we see mid is equal to three. All right, well, index 0, 1, 2, yeah, 3 would be out of bounds. So how did mid get to be 3? Well, mid is equal to low plus high divided by 2. So low is 2 and high is 2, so the average of those should be 2. Ah, here's our mistake. The division happens before the addition, so we end up with 2 divided by 2 is 1, plus 2 is 3. That's not right. We need to put some parentheses in here. So we add that and that. And now we see that mid is 2 as we wanted. We get the value of 4, which is what we're looking for, and we return index 2. All right. Now let's try looking for a number that's not in the list. So we go 3. and we get a runtime error, uh, live coding message limit exceeded. OK, so what's happening here? If we look up here, you can see that it's, it's basically stuck in an infinite loop. So we, if we go up here and we switch to the other window, if you go over to the right, you can see later iterations of the loop. All right, so what's happening? You, I guess that uh, while true was not a good idea after all. So when do we need to stop looking? Well, you can see that the numbers actually stop changing after that second loop. When we get to the third loop, it's one, two, two, one, two, two. Everything stays the same. 
So how do we know when we're done? Well, if you look, you can see that uh, high is 1 and low is 2. So low is higher than high once we get into this third loop. What that means is we've come from both ends all the way to the middle and crossed over. So instead of saying while true, you know it's time to give up when if uh, while low is less than or equal to high, then we continue. And if you get past that point, then it's time to quit. So here, after the second loop, high is lower than low. And so it falls out of this loop and returns minus 1, because that number that you were looking for wasn't in the list. At this point, I think I'm done. I can play around with it a little bit, maybe make a longer list, and search for some more items in it. Let's see if 6 is there. And uh, 600. It's not there. Good. OK. And about the only other thing is, if I were writing a real search function and putting it into a library module, I wouldn't want to have this call to the search function at the bottom of the file. So I can protect that using a similar pattern to the way you call your main function. So I say if name equals, but instead of main, there's a special name for it called live coding when you run it in this live coding mode. And so that will make it so that when you are editing it in live coding mode, you can it, see what happens, but this won't get called when you actually import this module from a real program. Now let's switch from live coding to live unit tests. As we were going through and building that search function, each time we changed the parameters to call the search function with, that would have made a good test case. So for the next section, I'm going to build another function and build up a set of unit tests as we go. So let's turn off live coding, switch over to a new uh, function, a new file, and I've set up a test class here, and uh, this demonstration is going to use the built-in unit test module, but the technique works as well with PyTest or any other test framework you like. So first I will uh, write out the way that we're going to call this function. Uh, this function is a, a little bit of a strange one that has to count the number of words in a list. So let's start with the list of words. Let's say apple and lemon. The strange part is that when two words have the same letters, like lemon and melon, we only count them as one. So we're actually counting anagrams, not uh, not all the words. OK, so but let's start easier. And we'll get rid of melon there. And we'll just count a list that doesn't have any duplicates in it. So that's what the words, list of words looks like. Uh, our test will call the function that we're going to write. And we call it count anagrams. We pass in the list of words. And then every good test has to actually validate the result. So we say self.assert equal. And we expect there to be two words in that list. So we expect that n will be equal to 2. All right, so that's what our test will look like. We'll save that. And if we ran that right now, it would fail because we haven't written the function. So let's go and write a first version of the function. So we'll switch over to the anagrams file. All right, let's define a function. Uh, count anagrams. And we say that uh, it's going to take in the list of words. And 
for now let's just return something silly we'll say it's zero all right so let's save that and now if we go back to the test and we need to add an import up here from and, oh I already have it up there okay so now if we run that you could either run it from the command prompt or here I'm going to use the compile function in Emacs and you can see that I've written the Python command to call unit test module and test the uh, test anagrams file okay all right so we get a failed test and if we go down here we can scroll down and see that we expected to and we got zero okay so that's a failing test so far that's just standard Python now how do we make these unit tests live unit tests well what we do is we get rid of that and we switch over to the uh, anagrams module okay and now we turn on live coding live pine mode all right so it's not calling anything because we haven't called count anagrams here at least not in this file what we need to do is tell live pi mode that we want to use a different script to run this and so we go control C escape D for driver and it says what's the driver command well we use that same driver command that we saw before uh, so we say we leave out the Python and we say dash M for module unit test and then it was the test anagrams module okay so if we run that we should see all right I'm going to leave some extra blank lines here just to make it easier to see and you can see over on the right hand side that it gets called with the list of words apple and lemon and the return value and up here what's this it's system exit that means that that's the way that Python tells us that uh, the test failed so if we just go we can change the result from zero to a simple calculation where we just get the length of words and that's enough to solve it for this simple test scenario so you can see that it's stopped failing let's save that and we go back to the test case and let's add a more challenging scenario we can copy that and paste it in and we'll give it a new name test duplicate and let's put in two lemons so now just counting them is not going to be good enough we need to avoid the duplicates uh, so we'll save that and switch back so now if I make a small change you can see that it's failing again and if we go over here you can see that it calls both of them here's the one with two lemons and here's the one with one lemon so it's a little bit cluttered so what I prefer to do is only run one test at a time especially if you had a bunch of tests in a, in a file you wouldn't want to run all of them at once so I can change the driver control C escape D and if you hit the up arrow it'll show you what you're currently using and we'll just add a little more to that so that's telling us the file that it's going to run we'll say the class uh, in the file is anagrams test and then the test method is test duplicate so that should now only run one that's great now let's make it pass so the best way to uh, count the number of things without duplicates is to use a set so we will say that words equals set words so that just turns the list into a set and over here you can see that the number of uh, 
basically the, the lemon got removed. Now we're going to try something where we actually start dealing with anagrams. So let's go up here and we'll copy the test case and paste a new one. And now I'm going to do something a little bit different this time. If I just keep creating a new one like test anagram and test whatever, give it a, each one a new name, every time I add a test case, I'm going to have to change the driver. So instead, what I'll do is I just always create the new one with a plain test name. And I use test in my driver. That way, whenever I add a new one, I don't have to change the driver. And after I get it to pass, then I give it a real name. So let's switch that second lemon into a melon. And now we can save it and go back to the code and we're going to change the driver control C escape D up arrow to see what we're currently using get rid of the duplicate on the end and now it's just plain test and you can see it's failing because it a regular set doesn't know that lemon and melon are supposed to be the same thing so how are we going to make that pass well the first thing I'm going to do is not use just a, a plain set like that uh, or at least I'm not going to pass it straight in from words so what I'll do is I'll create a new set called anagrams and it starts as an empty set and then I'm going to loop through for word in words and now we have to figure out how to tell when two words are anagrams of each other. Well, one easy way is to sort the letters in the word. So I'm going to say word equals sorted word. So you can see that that creates a list of letters, but I want to put it back together as a string. So what I can do is I create an empty string and I tell it to join all the letters. So that just means stick all those letters together into one string. So you can see apple turns into A-E-L-P-P -P when you sort all the letters. And lemon is elmno and the other lemon is also, sorry, the melon is also elmno. So you can see that one and that one match. So now I go back and stick that sorted word into the anagrams set dot add word. So now you can see the first time through the loop we get a e l p p in the in the set. Second time we add elmno, and the third time <clears throat> it doesn't change. Right because Elmno is already in the set. And so if we go back to the code and instead of doing the length of words, we say the length of anagrams, that should pass. And it does. The next case I want to handle is uppercase letters. So we need to change the name of this guy to be test anagrams and then we'll copy that and all right so i don't think we need the apple anymore let's do lemon and melon but we will make them both mixed case and now we expect that they should be one item because if we ignore the the case and just check the four anagrams they should be anagrams of each other and if we go back and make a small change so it runs you can see that it's failing all right so why is it failing well if we go over here and we look at the last one here you can see that we've got lemno and melno 
they sort differently because uppercase letters come before lowercase letters in the ASCII table. So at the end, you can say, see that the set has two entries in it. All right, so we need to fix the case. So let's go over here and let's make the word equal word dot lower. So now you can see lemno and melno. Ah, although they're both now lowercase, we did it, we changed the case after we sorted the letters. So let's fix that. Now, when we correct the order, we change them to lowercase and then we sort them and we get back to both being elmno and we get the right answer. All right, so we save that. And the final test case that I want to add is something a little odd. Uh, I'm going to make sure that it handles Unicode characters. Uh, so let's add an example. We're going to rename this guy to test upper for upper letter uppercase letters. We'll add a new one in here. Okay, so here's the scenario that I want to add. So sometimes foreign words. Let's take an example of Strasse, the German street for the German wor word for street. Stra so there's one way you can type it with two s's at the end. There's another character that they sometimes use in German uh, called a sharp s. So I'm going to the way to type it, at least in my operating system, is Control Shift U, and then the Unicode character. The Unicode code point is DF. So if I hit enter, there you can see that strange looking character is equivalent to two S's. So those two, those are two ways of writing the same word. And I want my function to be able to handle that. So we save that. Luckily, Python can help us out. So we switch back and if we go over here, you can see that the capital S is being changed to a lowercase s, but this thing is being left alone. Python has another function on string called fold case. Nope, case fold. There we go. And that is similar to lower. It changes an uppercase s to a lowercase s, but you can see it also takes some Unicode characters and converts them into the simpler form to basic s's. And now those two are equivalent. They get sorted the same way and we only get one item. So we can save that and we are all done. Now that I've got the last test case passing, Let's just run the full suite one more time. We can use compile and we launch that. We can see that we didn't break any of the other tests. They all kept running. All right, so then we can switch back to, remember that you can find the installation instructions on the website along with all the other versions of this tool that are available. There's this version in Emacs. Uh, there's a PyCharm version that includes Turtle Graphics, a Sublime Text version, and there's even a demo in the browser.